Yup, that's me running a Core i9-10900K at 6 GHz using Intel Cryo Cooling Technology. You probably wonder how I got here. Well, let me show you. Hello and welcome back to a brand new video. In this video, we'll be overclocking the Intel Core i9-10900K processor all the way up to 6 GHz using Intel Cryo Cooling Technology. This video will be a slightly different form than our regular Scatterbencher videos as we'll go a little bit more in detail in all of the technologies and the features that we're using to get to the best overclocking setting. So yeah, it's going to be a long video. Here's how we'll go about it. First, we'll have a closer look at what is Intel Cryo Cooling Technology. Then, we'll have a look at the BIOS configuration to get to 6 GHz. After that, I will go over each of the BIOS settings and explain why I'm using that specific setting. And lastly, we'll have a look at the performance gains from overclocking with the Intel Cryo Cooling Technology versus a regular high-end custom loop water cooling setup. We'll finish it off with some concluding thoughts. If you're looking for an easy guide on how to overclock the Core i9-10900K, feel free to check out Scatterbencher episode 10 where we go through the entire process. Before we get started, however, let's first have a look at the hardware that we use in this guide and what this Intel Cryo Cooling Technology is all about. Along with the Intel Core i9-10900K processor, in this guide we will be using the Asus ROG Maximus 12 Apex motherboard, an Asus ROG Strix RTX 2080 Ti graphics card, a pair of G-Skill Trident Z DDR4-4266 memory sticks, a Seasonic Prime 850 watt platinum power supply, the Elmore Labs P80 DB2 LPC debug card, and of course EK Quantum X water cooling. All this is mounted on top of our favorite open bench table. The cost of the component should be around $4,630. Intel Cryo Cooling Technology is touted as an intelligent, sub-ambient cooling product that provides a new and improved overclocking experience on desktops. It takes advantage of the Intel Thermal Velocity Boost feature, which aims to improve system performance by increasing the CPU frequency based on the CPU temperature. The Thermal Velocity Boost is different from the regular Turbo Boost, as Turbo Boost looks primarily at the available power budget. The cryo cooling technology is built around the thermoelectric effect. The thermoelectric effect is the conversion of differences in temperature to an electric voltage and vice versa. In the PC enthusiast space, it is best known as Peltier cooling. The Peltier effect creates a temperature difference by transferring heat between two electrical junctions. A voltage is applied across joint conductors to create an electric current. When the current flows through the junctions of the two conductors, heat is removed at one junction and cooling occurs. Simply put, more voltage makes one side go very hot and the other side go very cold. The main advantage of Peltier cooling for PC enthusiasts is that it allows you to get sub-ambient temperatures. And as we all know, lower temperatures means higher overclocks. Peltier cooling has been around for a very long time in the enthusiast space. In fact, we have references all the way down to 1997, going over the Swift Tech coolers, Thermal Take had one, Active Cool had one, Coolid had two of them. Even recently, we saw the Cooler Master V10 in 2009 and the V3 Voltaire in 2014. Perhaps the most recent example of it is the Phononic Hex 2.0 Tech Cooler. I don't want to go too deep in the what's and the whys of Peltier cooling, but suffice to say that while the technology has been around for over two decades in the enthusiast space, it still hasn't really found any footing in the mainstream market. That's because while there's a clear advantage of superior cooling technology, there's also some key disadvantages associated with Peltier cooling. First, condensation. A Peltier cooling can produce a temperature difference of up to 70 degrees centigrade between the hot and the cold side. So the cold side will be operating at a lower temperature than ambient. This will create condensation, which you all know doesn't mix very well with electronics. Second, efficiency. Peltier cooling consumes disproportionately high amounts of electrical energy for the heat it dissipates. Third, cooling. In order to maximize the benefit of the Peltier, you need to cool the hot side sufficiently. High-performance Peltier units, like the one included in the EK Quantum X Delta Tech, 
are rated up to 200 watts, which is significantly higher than a modern mainstream high performance CPU like the 10900K, which is rated up to 125 watts. Lastly, control. Most Pelche coolings out there provide the user with absolutely no control over the cooling, so it's either on or off, but nothing in between. So what makes Intel cryo cooling technology different then? If this technology has been tried, tested, and found non-viable for the past two decades, what makes Intel cryo cooling technology so interesting? Well, there's a couple of things actually. First, the Intel cryo cooling technology offers a software solution to control the Peltier temperature. In cryo mode, the tech cooling is only switched on when required and is switched off when not required. This greatly reduces the overall power consumed as the tech is not running at full power all the time. Second, the Intel controller also measures the humidity in the room. Based on this input, the controller can adjust the tech temperature to always be above the dew point. This helps to avoid any condensation issues. Thirdly, it maximizes the impact of the Intel Thermal Velocity Boost feature by ensuring best case operating temperatures. Using Thermal Velocity Boost also allows us to opportunistically benefit from the added frequency range as the frequency adjusts based on when we really need it. All things considered, the Intel cryo cooling technology is arguably the most well-rounded and advanced implementation of thermal electric cooling in the enthusiast space to date. At the moment of recording, Cryo cooling is supported by all the 10th generation K and KF CPUs on the desktop. Now, let's get our overclock on. Okay, so before I show you the settings I used to achieve 6 GHz, a word of warning. Do not try these settings at home unless you have this exact cooling solution and unless you know what you're doing. This is definitely not a beginner's guide and there's definitely an increased risk of damaging your components. So please be careful. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set CPU Core Ratio to By Core Usage. Enter the By Core Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 0 to 60. Set Turbo Ratio Course 0 to 4. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 54. Set Turbo Ratio Course 1 to 6. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 2 to 52. Set Turbo Ratio Course 2 to 10. Exit the By Core Usage submenu. Enter the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu. Set Overclocking TVB to Enabled. Set 1 Core Active to 10 Core Active to Enabled. Set Negative Ratio Offset A for 1 Core Active to 10 Core Active to User Specify. Then for 1 Core Active to 10 Core Active, set Temperature A, Negative Ratio Offset A, and Temperature B for additional minus 1x ratio to the following. 1 Core, 10, 3, 55. 2 Core, 10, 3, 51. 3 Core, 10, 4, 47. 4 Core, 10, 4, 43. 5 Core, 58, 1, 68. 6 Core, 54, 1, 64. 7 Core, 62, 1, 72. 8 Core, 58, 1, 68. 9 Core, 54, 1, 64. 10 Core, 50, 1, 60. Exit the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu. Enter the Tweaker's Paradise submenu. Set internal PLL voltage to 0.9. Set ring PLL voltage to 0.9. Set PLL bandwidth to level 1. Set eventual PLL termination voltage to 1.05. Exit the Tweaker's Paradise submenu. Enter the AI Features submenu. Set Package Temperature Threshold to 85. Set Regulate Frequency by Above Threshold to Enabled. Exit the AI Features submenu. Set CPU Core Cache Voltage to Adaptive Mode. Set Additional Turbo Mode CPU Core Voltage to 1.55. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Enter the CPU Power Management Control submenu. Ensure CPU C states is set to enabled. Go to the monitor menu. Enter the QFAN configuration submenu. Enter the chassis fan configuration submenu. Set chassis fan QFAN control to auto. Set chassis fan QFAN source to T sensor. Set chassis fan 2 profile to manual. Set the upper temperature to 50. Set the max duty cycle to 100%. Set the middle temperature to 30. Set the middle duty cycle to 60. 
Set the lower temperature to 25. Set the min duty cycle to 20%. Enter the boot menu. Set wait for F1 error to disabled. Then save and exit the BIOS. When in the operating system, make sure to set the Intel cryo cooling to unregulated mode. Now, simply wait until the CPU is sufficiently cooled down and you'll see the CPU running at 6 GHz. Right, now let's rewind all this and go over each of the BIOS settings and let me explain to you why I'm using them. Intel Extreme Memory Profile is a technology that allows you to automatically overclock the system memory to get more system performance. XMP is an extension to the standard JDEX specification that allows a memory vendor to program different settings onto the memory sticks. The settings include the memory frequency, the memory timings and the memory voltage. The Intel XMP standard uses this extension for overclocking purposes and adds a couple of features to the memory standard. Multiple SPD profiles, which allows for a number of different memory profiles that can be selected depending on the usage. Memory vendor specific SPD fields. This gives the memory module suppliers the ability to set a number of their own profiles based on the module's capabilities. Easy overclocking. This allows users to select predefined profiles rather than having to adjust all of the parameters individually in the BIOS. Advanced overclocking. This allows for more advanced users to change specific SPD parameters in the BIOS and save those profiles. Failsafe default boot. This allows you to restore to one of the default JDEX specifications after a bad configuration. There are two types of XMP certification. XMP ready means that the module was programmed with an uncertain but stable profile. XMP certifies means that the module was programmed with settings that have passed the supplier test for the CPU and motherboard. You can find a list of XMP certified products on Intel's website. If you want to know which XMP profiles your memory supports, there are several ways to do it. First, if your memory is rated above DDR4-3200, it almost definitely has an XMP profile. That's because the JDEX standard only goes up to DDR4-3200. Second, you can look it up in your BIOS and find the option to enable XMP. Most, if not all motherboards, support XMP and even allow you to check the specific configuration in the BIOS. Third, you can use CPU-Z and check the SPD tab. Here you will find the basic XMP profile settings in the timings table section. Personally, I almost always run XMP on all of my systems. That's because it's a very safe and an easy way to improve the system performance. Do note that some motherboards might, might increase the memory controller voltage to support the really high frequencies. In our case, the memory kit runs DDR4-4266 with CAS latency 19 and a memory voltage of 1.40 volt. Simply enabling it in the BIOS makes the magic happen. When we have a look at the Intel Core i9-10900K product specifications, we can find three Turbo Boost technologies listed. Intel Thermal Velocity Boost, Intel Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0, and Intel Turbo Boost Technology 2.0. Let's have a closer look at those last two. Intel has a long history of trying to give customers additional out-of-the-box performance. In fact, the history of Turbo Boost goes way, way back to February 1999. During the Spring 99 Intel Developer Forum, Intel announced the Gazerville technology. Gazerville would switch the operating frequency and voltage of a notebook processor depending on whether it's connected to AC power or battery powered. When using AC power, the frequency of the mobile Pentium 3 400 processor would increase to 500 MHz. Later that same year, during the Computex trade show, Intel demoed two notebook prototypes with this technology enabled. Gazerville would eventually make it to the market rebranded as Speedstep. About a decade and many iterations of dynamic frequency technologies later, including enhanced speed step and various forms of dynamic acceleration technology, in 2008 Intel introduced Turbo Boost 1.0 along with the Intel Core microarchitecture codenamed Nihalem. 
But the one cool thing I want to talk about today, you know, is how we convert this power headroom back into performance. That's what we're calling turbo mode. So the idea is if you have, let's say, four cores, and you detect that only, say, one or two cores are actually active, we turn the power gates off, the power of those cores goes to zero, then the power control unit takes all of this power, gives it back into higher voltages, higher frequency, and we get a boost in performance as a result. So literally, we're able to turn the, dynamically that available power budget into more performance. Absolutely. Turbo mode, that's really yep. cool. Three years later, Intel introduced a second version of Turbo Boost called, well, Turbo Boost 2.0. While the general principles are the same, there are some key differences between Turbo Boost 1.0 and Turbo Boost 2.0. First, Turbo Boost 2.0 increased the amount of turbo bins over base frequency. Second, Turbo Boost 2.0 factors into account not only the CPU cores, but also the other parts of the CPU die. For example, the integrated graphics can boost to a higher frequency in gaming workloads where the GPU performance is more important than the CPU performance. But most importantly, Turbo Boost 2.0 expands the power budget to well above the TDP rating. This last point is crucial to understanding how Turbo Boost works. Take note the processor can safely operate above TDP for short periods of time when there is sufficient headroom. The headroom expands when the processor has been at lower power for a while, the headroom is reduced when the system has been running at high power, the Turbo Boost algorithm works according to a proprietary EWMA formula. This stands for Exponentially Weighed Moving Average. The exact formula is not known, but we can do a simple test to demonstrate the behavior. Hey guys, it's Editing Peter here. I have a couple of charts in Excel that will help you understand how Turbo Boost 2.0 works in the real world. So let's have a look. To demonstrate how Turbo Boost 2.0 works, I set the BIOS to enforce all default Turbo Boost limits. Then I use Prime95 to track the CPU package power. When we run Prime95 with AVX, you can see that the turbo is enabled for about 38 seconds. The power consumption reaches 235 watts and then drops sharply to 125 watts. If we run Prime95 without AVX, the turbo is enabled for about 45 seconds. That's because the power consumption is only 210 watts. The power budget at the beginning of each test was the same. However, since our non-AVX workload is less demanding, the power budget is consumed at a rate that's much slower than our AVX workload. So we can turbo for longer. When we run an even less demanding workload with eight threads compared to the default 20 threads, we can see that the turbo boost duration is much longer. The turbo boost is maintained for well over one minute. That's because the power consumption here is only about 160 watts. If we add an additional voltage offset of 0.1 volt on top of our most demanding workload, Prime95 with AVX and all 20 threads enabled, we can see a big impact on the turbo boost. Instead of 38 seconds, we only get 29 seconds of turbo time. That's because more voltage means more power. In our case, the power increases to almost 250 watts. Lastly, just for comparison, here's what the chart looks like with unlocked power limits. The CPU package power reaches over 275 watt sustained. While this will deliver amazing performance, it will also need a very strong cooling solution. I also tracked a bunch of other metrics and put them in an easy to understand table for you. You can see that depending on your workload and the Turbo Boost configuration, you can see a wide range of frequencies, voltages, temperatures, and power consumption figures. In 2016, Intel introduced the Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0. While it carries the same Turbo Boost name, it's not really an iteration on Turbo Boost 2.0. Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0 aims to exploit the natural variance in CPU core quality observed in multi-core CPUs. As you may know, there is a certain variance in overclocking capabilities between CPUs. Well, there's also a certain variance in quality between the cores inside a CPU. With Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0, Intel has a way of identifying the best cores in your CPU and we call those the favored cores. The favored cores are important for two reasons. First, Intel allows for additional overclocking of the favored cores. On the Comet Lake 10900K, two out of the 10 cores will boost to 5.3 GHz, while the others are limited to 5.1 GHz. Two, the operating system will automatically assign the most demanding workloads to these favored cores, ensuring a potential higher performance. 
On Broadwell E, Turbo Boost Max 3.0 was available for one core. On Skylake X, this feature expanded to two cores. The latest iteration of Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0 allows boosting of up to four cores on certain architectures. In some motherboard biases, you can find out which of your CPU's cores are the favored cores. Now that we know how Turbo Boost works, we can finally understand the BIOS configuration. We unlock all the power limits because we don't want any constraints while overclocking. We can also make a couple of predictions. One, it's very likely that two out of the 10 cores have higher overclocking capabilities than any of the others. Two, unlocking the power limits may cause severe thermal issues in very demanding workloads. These two points will be addressed at a later stage in the video. There are two main ways how to configure the CPU ratio. Sync all cores and by core usage. Sync all cores sets one ratio that is applied across all the cores. This is very much the traditional way of overclocking. Of course, back in the day where we only had one, two, three or four cores, the quality difference between the cores was relatively small. So there was not that much benefit to max out each core independently. Nowadays, even mainstream CPUs have up to 16 cores, meaning that the quality difference between the cores can vary greatly. By core usage allows us to configure the overclock for different scenarios ranging from one active core to all 10 active cores. This enables us to run some cores significantly faster than others when the conditions are right. Note that by core usage is not the same as configuring each core specifically. When using by core usage, we determine an overclock according to the actual usage. For example, if a workload is using four cores, then the CPU will determine by itself which cores should execute this workload and will apply our set frequency to those cores. In our case, we configured the CPU to set 60x ratio for up to four active cores, 54x for up to six active cores, and 52x for up to all active cores. As you can see, we're trying to squeeze out an extra 800 megahertz worth of performance for a couple of cores compared to all 10 cores. That's a pretty big difference. In 2018, Intel introduced the Thermal Velocity Boost technology along with the Intel Core i9-8950HK mobile flagship processor. Thermal Velocity Boost opportunistically increases the clock frequency above the Turbo Boost 2.0 frequency based on how much the processor is operating below its maximum temperature. The frequency gain and duration is dependent on the workload, the capabilities of the processor and the processor cooling solution. For processors that have Intel Thermal Velocity Boost enabled, the maximum core frequency is achieved while the processor is at a pre-specified temperature or lower. For the 10900K, the pre-specified temperature is 70 degrees centigrade. While for mobile chips, it's usually more around 50 degrees centigrade. Another TVB feature that many people tend to overlook is the voltage guard band depending on core temperature. Traditionally, the voltage requested by the processor is based on the worst case temperature scenario of 100 degrees centigrade. However, a well-cooled processor requires less voltage to run the same frequency. When thermal velocity boost is enabled, the processor will automatically reduce the operating voltage if the CPU temperature is below 100 degrees centigrade. This is, of course, very helpful in scenarios where the cooling is great but still limited. Like, for example, in high-performance gaming notebooks. The lower temperature will not only result in lower voltage, but in turn, the lower voltage will reduce the temperature. This cycle will assist the CPU to get into the thermal velocity boost range and create more opportunities for higher boost frequencies. With the introduction of Intel cryocooling technology, Intel opened up the thermal velocity boost configuration to motherboard vendors. Obviously, thermal velocity boost is exploiting the additional overclocking headroom because of the lower temperatures thanks to cryocooling. You can use either XTU or, on the motherboards that support it, configure thermal velocity boost from the BIOS. The easiest way to understand the thermal velocity boost configuration is by going from the top ratio to the bottom ratio. After configuring the settings, save and exit, then go back into the BIOS and back into the TVB submenu. Now you will see a full table of the configuration. The first column is to describe the amount of active cores going from 1 to 10 with the 10900K. The second column describes the maximum possible ratio for a particular amount of active cores. In our configuration, the maximum ratio for one core active is 60 and the maximum ratio for 10 cores active is 52. 
Since we keep a fixed base clock frequency of 100 MHz, this results in 6 GHz and 5.2 GHz. The third column describes the first temperature offset point. When the CPU exceeds this temperature, it will decrease the ratio of the CPU. In my configuration, when the CPU temperature exceeds 10 degrees and 4 cores are active, then the CPU will decrease the ratio. Similarly, when the temperature exceeds 50 degrees and 10 cores are active, the CPU will also decrease the frequency. The fourth column describes the ratio offset for the temperature configured in the third column. So, when the CPU temperature exceeds 10 degrees and 4 cores are active, the ratio will decrease by 4. 6 minus 4 is 56. So, the CPU will run the 4 cores at 5.6 GHz. The fifth column is an additional temperature offset point. The function is the same like the first temperature offset, but in this case the ratio cannot be configured and is always set to decrease one additional step. So in my case, the CPU frequency for two active cores will be 6 GHz. If the temperature is higher than 10 degrees centigrade, then the frequency will drop to 5.7 GHz. If the temperature exceeds 51 degrees centigrade, then it will further drop one ratio to, to 5.6 GHz. I don't have that much to tell you about the tweaker's paradise other than don't touch anything unless you know exactly what you're doing. The tweaker's paradise offers expert users to fine tune certain settings when trying to squeeze the maximum out of their CPU. It is primarily used by extreme overclockers who use liquid nitrogen to achieve overclocking world records. The only reason why I have to configure these four voltages is because of auto rules. The motherboard uses auto rules to configure certain voltages and other settings to ensure additional stability. A good example of auto rules is when the CPU increases the voltage of the memory controller when using high frequency XMP memory. Another example of auto rules is the motherboard unlocking the turbo boost limitations when the user initiates manual overclocking. In this case, setting 60x ratio triggers some extreme overclocking auto rules. Yes, that's right. The motherboard thinks that I'm about to use liquid nitrogen. If I don't set these voltages manually, the system automatically increases them to ensure stability when extreme overclocking. The result is that the system would not post and get stuck on one of the BIOS codes. So to make sure the motherboard knows that I'm not about to use liquid nitrogen, I set these four voltages and everything boots up like normal. In 2018, the ASUS ROG team first introduced AI overclocking. AI overclocking includes three features, AI overclocking, AI cooling, and AI networking. We covered the benefits and the use case of AI overclocking in our previous Core i9-10900K overclocking video. Since we're not going to be using it in this guide, I will not further discuss it. If you want to know how it works, just go back to Scatterventure episode 10 and have a look there. We will, however, use the ACES AI cooling function. Hey guys, it's Editing Peter here. I just wanted to show you a couple of charts that will very clearly show you why this AI cooling feature is the right choice for us. So let's just jump straight into it. With the Delta Tech installed, I used Prime95 with AVX and tracked the CPU package power and temperature in three different scenarios. One, all power limits unlocked. Two, all power limits unlocked, but long duration power limit is set to 170 watts. Three, all power limits unlocked, but the AI cooling is targeting 85 degrees centigrade as the CPU temperature. As we can see from the two charts, in the first scenario, the power consumption reaches about 300 watts after not even a minute. The temperature also reaches 100 degrees centigrade. This is simply not sustainable, and we have to abort the test or risk a system crash. It is of course understandable that the setting is not stable since our tech is rated up to 200 watt only and the power consumption is far above that limit. In the second scenario, the system is stable. We can see that initially the power consumption tracks the same like the unlocked power limits, but then sharply decreases once the available turbo boost power limit is used up. Long duration, the CPU power consumption is 170 watts. We can also see that the CPU temperature reaches almost 100 degrees centigrade after 50 seconds. While the system power consumption is reduced in time, we're still on the edge. Ideally, we would like to have the long duration power to be equal to the tech limit of 200 watts. In the third scenario, the system is also stable. We can see that the initial burst of performance is less long than the two other scenarios. 
That is because the system starts reducing the CPU power consumption when 85 degrees centigrade is reached. However, we can also see that the long duration power consumption is much higher than all of the other scenarios. That's because the system will dynamically adjust the frequency depending on the temperature headroom. In our case, we set the target temperature to 85 degrees centigrade and we see the power limit gradually decrease over time. Not only does this help us mitigate the risk of thermal runaway very effectively, it also allows us to maximize the performance initially in the workload very well. Generally, there's two ways to configure the voltage on Intel platforms, adaptive mode and override mode. Override mode specifies a single static voltage across all ratios. It is mostly used for extreme overclocking purposes where stability at very high frequencies is the only consideration. Adaptive mode is the standard mode of operation. In adaptive mode, the VF curve used is generated automatically by the CPU and covers the CPU ratios from the lowest supported ratio to the default maximum turbo ratio. In the case of the 10900K, that's from 8X to 53X. VF curve stands for voltage frequency curve. The VF curve determines which voltage the CPU should set for a certain frequency. The entire VF curve can be offset by up to 500 millivolts in both directions. Also, since Comet Lake, Intel has extended the adaptive voltage function with an advanced voltage offset. It is implemented in the ASUS BIOS as the VF point offset. VF point offset allows the user to change the default VF curve by offsetting the voltage at certain frequencies on the VF curve. So we can offset the VF curve either with a global offset or an offset at a specific point of the VF curve with VF point offset. Anyway, we must choose between adaptive mode and override mode. Since we are configuring a very dynamic system with frequencies ranging from 50x to 60x and active cores ranging from one active core to 10 active cores, obviously we have to choose for adaptive mode. Now, how do we know which voltage to set? That's both very simple and very complex. I'll try to keep it short and simple. There are three steps to how your system sets the CPU voltage in adaptive mode. First, the motherboard BIOS tells the processor the current load line characteristics via AC-DC load line values. Then, the CPU will request a voltage from the voltage controller based on its own programmed VF curve as well as the load line characteristics. Finally, the voltage that reaches the CPU is the requested voltage minus any undershoot or overshoot from the VRM load line. The AC-DC load line characteristics are basically a way for the motherboard to inform the CPU about the VRM design. Based on the specific design, the CPU will factor in a certain voltage droop when requesting a VID. Voltage droop is the decrease of voltage when a core goes from idle to full load. The VRM load line setting determines how much the output voltage increases or decreases when the CPU goes from a low load to a high load and vice versa. Simply put, a big undershoot or big overshoot can result in an unstable setting. So VRM load line helps to mitigate these problems. You can check out the article titled VRM Load Line Visualized by Elmore Labs for more details. So now that we know how voltage setting works in adaptive mode, a couple more things. First, unless you use either offset or VF point offset, the adaptive mode voltage you set in the BIOS only applies when the frequency is higher than the highest default maximum turbo ratio, or in the case of the 10900K, any ratio above 53X. For any ratio of 53X or lower, the default VF curve is followed. There are also specific rules that govern the voltage that can be set. For one, the voltage set for a specific ratio cannot be lower than the voltage set at a lower ratio, meaning if our 10900K is specified to run 53X at 1.5 volt, then setting adaptive voltage to anything below 1.5 volts is pointless. Also, the adaptive voltage configured for any ratio below the maximum default turbo ratio will be ignored. Take the same example of the 10900K, which is specified to run 53X at 1.5 volt. If we try to, for example, configure all cores to 52X and set 1.5 volt, the CPU will ignore this because it has its own specified voltage for all ratios up to 53x and will use this voltage. So returning to our BIOS configuration, for all frequencies below 53x, 
we can use the default VF curve to determine the right voltage. For all frequencies over 53x, we must determine the right voltage. We have two good options. Either we set the adaptive voltage manually, or we set a VF.8 offset. Either way we use to set the voltage will work. Just remember that the set voltage is also dependent on other factors like load line. Also remember that the voltage from 53x to 60x will be set equally. So my 54x 6 cores fully active will get the same voltage as my 60x 1 core in idle. Without going too much into detail, C states are idle power states. The C states help the operating system know which cores are active and which aren't, so that the operating system knows which cores they can hand out new tasks to. We want to make sure C states are enabled because we need the operating system to be aware which cores are active and which aren't to determine two things. One, we want to know if our Turbo Boost Max 3.0 favorite cores are available to take on new tasks because these will boost higher. Two, we want the operating system to know if enough cores are idle so that they can boost the other cores to a higher frequency. The motherboard should set the right C states by default but manually enabling the C states ensures this is the case. QFAN is a feature that's been around since the early 2000s on ASUS motherboards. Its main function is to regulate the system fans according to how taxed the system is. Today's implementation of QFAN is of course much more advanced than it was 20 years ago. For this guide, we will use one specific feature. We configure the chassis fan 2 to follow the T sensor. We connect a temperature sensor to the header near the bottom of the board and put the sensor in our water loop. We do this to address a specific issue with the tech cooling in unregulated mode. By default, the system fans are mapped against the CPU temperature. When we set the cryo cooling to unregulated mode, the CPU temperature will be very low in idle. Therefore, the radiator fans will not spin up and the radio will therefore not be actively cooled. However, in unregulated mode, the tech is working at full power and must be actively cooled. In our case, the Delta tech adds 200 watts of load in the water loop. So this creates a problem. On the one hand, we're adding heat in the loop because of unregulated mode. And on the other hand, the fans are not spinning up also because of unregulated mode. This can potentially get out of hand. With our configuration, we ensure that the water temperature is monitored in unregulated mode, and if the temperature rises too much, action is taken. This is the simplest of all settings to understand. By default, the system will give an error if no fan is connected to the CPU fan header. Since we're using water cooling to cool the CPU, we don't have a fan connected to the CPU fan header. By disabling the settings, we will not see the error and the system will easily boot. Right, now that we got all the way up to 6 GHz, let's have a look at the performance gains. We compared two systems. One is a regular high-end water-cooled system with the EK Magnitude water block. The other one is our tech setup with the Delta Tech. All other parts, including the Coolstream PE360 radiator, remain the same. Here's a list of the benchmarks used in this guide. Super Pi 4M, Geekbench 5, HWBOT X265, Cinebench R23, Realbench version 2.56, 3D Mark Nidraid, V-Ray 5, Final Fantasy 14, Prime 95 small FFT with AVX enabled. To check the performance at stock configuration, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu, set ASUS multi-core enhancement to disabled and force all limits, then save and exit the BIOS. Before we get started with pushing the performance of the Core i9-10900K processor, let's first have a look at the scoring at default settings. Super Pi 4M, 36.091 seconds. Geekbench 5 Single, 1,388 points. Geekbench 5 Multi, 9,453 points. HWBOT X265 4K, 17.104 frames per second. Cinebench R23, 13,079 points. V-Ray 5, 11,357 V samples. Realbench version 2.56, 170,151 points. 3 mark Night Raid, 42,130 marks. Final Fantasy 14, 88.56 frames per second. When running Prime 95 small FFT with AVX enabled, the processor runs at 3.75 GHz with 1.017 volt. The CPU power is around 127 watt 
and the average CPU temperature is 56 degrees centigrade. As a first test, we'll overclock the system using a regular high-end custom loop water cooling with the EK Magnitude water block. We'll test two overclocking scenarios. First, we'll just unlock all the power limits. This will allow our processor to run for an unlimited time at the highest possible turbo boost ratios. Second, we will do some manual overclocking and push our CPU to its maximum stable configuration for both single-threaded and multi-threaded applications. Also, we will enable XMP for all scenarios. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement 2 Enable Remove All Limits. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and got the following performance compared to default configuration. When running Prime95 small FFT with AVX enabled, the processor runs at 4.9 GHz with 1.278 volts. The CPU power is around 285 Watt and the average CPU temperature is 83 degrees centigrade. Next up, manual overclocking. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement 2 Enable Remove All Limits. Set AVX Instruction Core Ratio Negative Offset to 2. Set CPU Core Ratio to By Core Usage. Enter the By Core Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 0 to 55. Set Turbo Ratio Course 0 to 4. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 54. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 54. Set Turbo Ratio Course 1 to 6. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 2 to 53. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 2 to 8. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 3 to 52. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 3 to 10. Exit the By Core Usage submenu. Set CPU Core Cache Voltage to Adaptive Mode. Set Additional Turbo Mode CPU Core Voltage to 1.525 volts. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Enter the CPU Power Management Control submenu. Ensure CPU C states are set to Enabled. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and got the following performance compared to stock configuration. When running Prime95 small FFT with AVX enabled, the processor runs at 5 GHz with 1.307 volts. The CPU power is around 312 Watt and the average CPU temperature is 87 degrees centigrade. In the second phase of our overclocking journey, we'll overclock the system using Intel cryocooling technology. All the components remain the same, we just swap out the magnitude for the Delta Tech. We'll use the Delta Tech in two modes, cryo mode and unregulated mode. In cryo mode, the Intel software ensures that the tech never drops below the dew point. This avoids any form of condensation to occur. In unregulated mode, the tech always runs at full power and thus the temperature will drop well below ambient. Without proper insulation, you may face water droplets on your hardware, so please be careful. Make sure to follow the Delta Tech installation guide and take all of the necessary precautions to avoid condensation. If you're also using the Maximus 12 Apex, make note of the condensation sensor around the socket. While this feature is mostly targeted at the extreme overclockers using liquid nitrogen, it comes in handy with unregulated mode as well. We'll try the two modes in a variety of scenarios. Stock, unlocked, using ASUS's thermal velocity boost profiles and then do some manual overclocking. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Disabled and Force All Limits. Then save and exit the BIOS. When in the operating system, make sure to set the Intel Cryo Cooling to Cryo Mode. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default configuration. We can see that the performance is slightly higher in all benchmarks. This is due to the cryo cooling ensuring better operating temperatures. The lower than regular water cooling temperatures help the CPU stay in turbo for longer and also help enable thermal velocity boost for longer. When running Prime95 Smell FFT with AVX enabled, the processor runs at 3.7 GHz with 1 volt. The CPU power is around 121 Watt and the average CPU temperature is 53 degrees centigrade. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Then save and exit the BIOS. When in the operating system, make sure to set the Intel Cryo Cooling to Cryo Mode. We reran the benchmarks and got the following performance increase compared to default operation. We can see that the performance continues to rise. 
The performance increases can be attributed to the better temperatures, which enables the CPU to stay in thermal velocity boost for longer. Cinebench R23 failed because of a thermal runaway situation. In case you didn't know, Cinebench R23 introduces a 10 minute heat up before running the benchmark. That means the CPU is at full load for an extended period of time. It is during this heat up phase that we get a thermal runaway situation and overheating. That's because, as we explained earlier in the video, the tech is capable of handling up to 200 watt load. When we use unlock turbo configuration, the load is around 280 watts. When running Prime95 small FSD with AVX enabled, we face exactly the same thermal runaway situation and the system simply crashes. Now let's start exploring the potential additional overclocking headroom that cryo cooling offers us. Our first step will be to use the ASUS Thermal Velocity Boost profiles offered on the Maximus 12 Apex motherboard. We will enable the plus two boost profile for each of the three overclocking configurations we tried with water cooling, stock, unlocked, and manual. For stock comparison, upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu, set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Disabled and Force All Limits, enter the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu, set Overclocking TVB to Plus 2 Boost Profile, then save and exit the BIOS. When in the operating system, make sure to set the Intel Cryo Cooling to Cryo Mode. For unlocked comparison, upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Enter the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu. Set Overclocking TVB to Plus 2 Boost Profile. Then save and exit the BIOS. When in the operating system, make sure to set the Intel Cryo Cooling to Cryo Mode. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enable to Remove All Limits. Set AVX Instruction Core Ratio Negative Offset to 2. Set CPU Core Ratio to By Core Usage. Enter the By Core Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 0 to 55. Set Turbo Ratio Core 0 to 4. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 52. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 1 to 6. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 2 to 51. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 2 to 8. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 3 to 50. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 3 to 10. Exit the By Core Usage submenu. Enter the Internal CPU Power Management submenu. Set Long Duration Package Power Limit to 170. Exit the Internal CPU Power Management submenu. Enter the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu. Set Overclocking TVB to Plus 2 Boost Profile. Exit the Thermal Velocity Boost submenu. Set CPU Core Cache Voltage to Adaptive Mode. Set Additional Turbo Mode CPU Core Voltage to 1.525. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Enter the CPU Power Management Control submenu. Ensure CPU C states is set to enabled. Then save and exit the BIOS. When in the operating system, make sure to set the Intel Cryo Cooling to unregulated mode. We reran the benchmarks and got the following performance increase compared to default configuration. For stock and plus two TVB boost profile in Cryo mode, for unlocked and plus two TVB boost profile in Cryo mode, Cinebench R23 again failed because of a thermal runaway situation. For manual OC and plus two TVB boost profile in cryo mode, when running Prime95 small FFT with AVX enabled, the processor runs at 4166 megahertz with 1.072 volts. The CPU power is around 171 watt and the average CPU temperature is 68 degrees centigrade. In our last and final step of the overclocking journey, we will try unregulated mode. In unregulated mode, the Delta Tech cools below ambient temperature with less protection from condensation. In this mode, there will be condensation risk on the heatsink surfaces and the surroundings due to the low temperature. Please take all the necessary precautions when using unregulated mode. It can cause condensation, which may short circuit your hardware and cause damage. We'll compare 
two scenarios. The first one is our manual overclock using the plus two boost profile from the previous configuration. And the second one is our six gigahertz overclock from the very beginning of the video. We re-ran the benchmarks and got the following performance increase compared to default operation. For manual OC and plus two DVB boost profile in unregulated mode, for manual OC and manual thermal velocity boost in unregulated mode. Before we get to the concluding thoughts, let's first compare the performance of all of our different overclocks. Looking at the pure benchmark score comparison, we notice a couple of things. First, in heavy multi-threaded benchmark applications like Cinebench R23 and V-Ray 5, regular high-end custom loop water cooling comes out on top. That's because the cooling system is capable of handling power consumption loads over 200 watt with ease. The tech is limited to 200 watts. So when a workload comes by that exceeds this, either the CPU will start heating up faster, reducing the frequency faster, or not work altogether. Citibench R23 in particular is a tough nut to crack. As mentioned before, if we don't either limit the long duration maximum power or have the system target a specific temperature, the system will just not pass the benchmark. Second, our max out overclock using unregulated mode has the most wins across all benchmarks and is particularly strong in lightly threaded workloads like SuperPi and Geekbench 5 single threaded. That's it, the performance difference with using just one of ASUS's TVV Boost profiles is not that significant. However, it looks like all things considered, a well-tuned cryo-cooled setup will give you more performance than a regular high-end water cooling system. Looking at the maximum CPU ratio table, you can see why the performance difference across all cryo-cooling systems isn't that large. Without manual tuning, we already get up to 55x for a couple of cores and up to 51x for 10 cores. Looking at the Prime95 small FFT with AVX comparison, we note again that a configuration with power limits unlocked will fail long-term stability tests unless we set other constraints. We achieved about 4.5 GHz stable with our manual maxed out system. While that is still well above the 3.7 GHz at stock, it is well below the 5 GHz we can achieve with high-end custom loop water cooling. All right, let's wrap this up. I really enjoyed tinkering with the Intel cryo cooling technology. In the past couple of weeks, it took me quite some time to get around all of the different issues but it's really satisfying to see all of the different technologies come together and eventually produce a six gigahertz overclock. Admittedly, it doesn't run games or any other application at this speed, but seeing it idle in Windows at this frequency is still very exciting. We can see some additional performance benefits in lightly threaded workloads from the higher frequencies reaching up to 5.7 gigahertz. That said, we must also acknowledge that the Core i9-10900K is already a very well-tuned beast with its maximum boost frequency of 5.3 GHz. The actual time that the cryo system is running at higher frequencies than this default configuration is not that much. So we're really talking about marginal performance gains. The multi-threaded performance is lower than what we see from a well-tuned system with high-end custom loop water cooling. That is of course to be expected since the power consumption can easily exceed 300 watts on a highly overclocked i9-10900K running a very demanding workload. This is far above the 200 watt maximum capability of the tech integrated in the EK Quantum X Delta tech. That said, with the right BIOS settings and options, we can mitigate this problem relatively well. Our maximum stable overclock in Prime95 small FFT with AVX enabled is 5 GHz with custom loop water cooling and 4.5 GHz with our tech system. That is still much, much higher than the 3.7 GHz we get at stock. To sum up my experience, I would say that this was quite an interesting overclocking journey. The cryo cooling technology had me hooked on tuning for several weeks, and it's always nice to find new ways to extract even more performance from your system. I'd say for a first generation technology, this is already quite a solid implementation. Intel was quite smart to work with industry partners like EK and Cooler Master, as well as the motherboard vendors to bring a complete package to the market. The complete package of course includes the software, the cooling equipment, as well as the motherboard BIOS support. 
I look forward to seeing what Intel can do with next generations of cryocooling and how it will enable us to extract more performance out of next generation CPUs. Well, that's it for this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and till the next time.